all this is dr mubeen sayed from drbeen.com welcome to one more show so once again we have some rock stars with us and you know that our rock stars are our medical colleagues so uh, our colleagues today they are from you probably remember dr mark a levet and his talks so we have katherine and lindsay from his department they are from let me just very quickly show you they are from children's national hospital washington dc if i am correct here yes washington dc and from dr mark a levitt's <laughs> dr mark a levitt's department this is katherine's biography and this is lindsay's so with this why not we actually ask katherine and lindsay welcome katherine let's start from you tell us a little bit about yourself Sure. So I'm Catherine. I'm one of the nurse practitioners with the colorectal program at DC Children's. Um, I am also now the clinical lead. So just try to help with our clinical program, both outpatient and inpatient. And I am fortunate enough to have been at the hospital since Mark walked in the door and we got to start this bowel management program or colorectal program uh, up together. But I've been doing bowel management with patients since about 2017, where we're able to address some of their struggles with both constipation and fecal incontinence. Awesome. Thank you very much. And Lindsay, tell us about yourself. Hi, I'm Lindsay. I'm a nurse practitioner here in the program. I've been here since 2020. Um, but prior to that, I worked in actually fetal medicine. So I saw some of these conditions prior to birth. So it's been a really fascinating learning and, and working more on the pediatric side. Um, and I work alongside fellow nurse practitioners and physician assistants and nurses, and I'm constantly learning from all of our urology and surgery and GYN fellows and attending. So it's been a, a fascinating area to work in. Awesome. So once again, welcome. And as you can see, Cool Beans here are welcoming you as well. So uh, <laughs> shall we put up your presentation and you take it away then? Sure. Okay, let's do that. So the topic today is going to be the bowel management and case studies of it. Yeah, so, so Julie, please, Julie, yes, please. <laughs> Julie Schwakey and myself uh, presented a few months ago, I think, on a bowel management lecture. So a lot of patients who come to our colorectal program have either Hirschsprung's disease or anorectal malformations or functional constipation. And even after they have the best surgery by the best surgeon, a lot of these patients continue to struggle with their regular bowel movements. And so we have a bowel management program set up for them where we can help to address those issues. Um, so we had performed kind of a, a lecture talking about the, the medications and the strategies that we use. And then there was the request to kind of talk through some specific case studies and to, to you know, um, go through the steps as to how we get a patient on a, a good regimen for them. So that was our goal for today. Um, so Lindsay and I are going to be going through a couple different case studies with you, but feel free to ask any questions. Um, and we do not have any disclosures. So the first patient I want to discuss with you is a five-year-old little guy, boy uh, who weighs about 17 kilos and had an anorectal malformation. This is not a picture of the actual patient. This is an adorable little boy from Google, uh, but sometimes it just helps to have a <laughs> face to a name. So this little guy originally presented to the emergency room when he was like three or four months of age and had epididymitis. And so when they had tried to catheterize him in the emergency room to get a urine sample, they had a lot of struggle. And then they were trying to get a urine sample by putting a, a, a urinary bag over his penis. And he was having wet diapers, but they couldn't seem to collect anything in the bag, which seemed to trigger them uh, to the thought process that he might have what's called a rectourethral fistula. So the urine was actually escaping out through the rectum. Uh, so if you go on to the next slide, he went on to have a vesicostomy and then also a, a cystoscopy where his rectourethral fistula was identified and then eventually a, a PSART procedure. We saw him in clinic closer to the eight time that he was approaching five years of age. Um, so he was probably about four. Um, and we did a repeat exam under anesthesia just to make sure that we didn't need to do any additional surgery and that the PSRP it had previously was intact and, and everything looked good. 
Um, and from his examiner anesthesia, we saw that his anal location was normal. Um, he did have a little bit of mild prolapse, um, but no strictures and he had excellent sphincters uh, with contractions present. So from an anatomical perspective, we felt that it was appropriate to proceed with, with putting him on a bowel regimen. So then if you go to the next slide. So for a patient like this, there's a lot to consider when you're talking about what type of bowel regimen is gonna work best. Uh, the first thing we look at is, is obviously his age because and because he's five years old, that means that he's approaching kindergarten or he's a, or he's in kindergarten. So he's at the point in his life where he really kind of needs to be able to stay clean and dry during the day. Um, so that's really important. But also when we consider his age, you're talking about if somebody's developmentally appropriate for whatever type of care you're, you're going to proceed with. You know, could he cooperate if we were going to do enemas um, or is he cognizant and aware of the, of what he's feeling if you're talking about laxatives. And then we also want to know if he's five years of age through that whole five years, past five years, has he ever been clean for stool? And has he ever had good success with any bowel regimen? Um, because that's going to also guide us in our therapy. We also take a look at the type of, and oh, hold on one second. <laughs> we take a look at the type of anorectal malformation that he has, and I'll talk more about that on the next slide. But that also is something that we take into consideration. We want to look at his spine, um, and in his case, he did have fine yeah, yeah. imaging, yeah. Fine imaging yeah. that showed he had a possibility of tethered cord. We also look at the development of his sacrum because we want to make sure that that's fully well developed because that can hinder somebody's ability to, to stay continent. And then, like I said, we look at their bowel management history. And prior to coming to us, as he's four years old, um, he did not have a bowel regimen and he was stooling four or five times a day, mushy consistency, but not toilet trained. He, he was having multiple accidents a day. A quick question from Broken. He says, was he born with this? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. So if you go on to the next slide. So it just kind of repeats the, the, main things that we want to consider on an anorectal malformation patient is the type of malformation that they have. And you can see on this, um, what we call as kind of like a scorecard or the, their predictor of continence, it shows how different anorectal malformations have an easier prognosis when you're talking about continence. And so there are some malformations that we know that we're going to go kind of right to enemas because that's going to be the most reliable treatment for them. And then there's other patients where we have a, a better ability to probably try laxatives. So if you hit the slide one time, it should show you that he had a recto uh, urethral fistula, uh, recto prostatic specifically. So that gives him about a two. And then if you hit it again in relation to his spine, it did look like he had an abnormal spinal imaging, which also gave him a two. And then if you look at his sacrum, he had a, a normal, actually good sacral ratio, which gave him a one. So you tally these up and he had a score of about a five, which using our predictor continence uh, index, we can tell families that he has a fair potential for continence uh, down the road. We were fortunate, however, also, if you hit the next slide, that we had some imaging on him um, so this was a contrast study when he came to us, and you can see that his colon is really dilated um, down towards the bottom there. So we also take that into consideration because we know that a colon that's really dilated is going to have a difficult time functioning normally. You know, your colon contracts in order to get stool out, but if you have a really dilated colon and it is contracting, it's not actually effectively pushing stool through. So that also gives us um, some guidance when we're talking about what to do next for him. So Got it. And just a quick question, Catherine. Yeah. Aren't these all dilated this and this whole? Yeah, yeah. It's just you can see at the bottom. Of it's from you. it's hmm. just significantly dilated there at the bottom. But yes, I would say throughout his entire colon, he's got dilation. Got it. So, but, and which really is just an indicator of how long he's been chronically constipated and not having good regular bowel movements. Got it. Thank you. Mm-hmm. So then what do we do next? Um, so because of all of these factors that we talked about, because he's five, because he needs to be clean, because he's never been clean, 
because his colon is so dilated, we talked about putting him on daily enemas in order to try to decompress that colon and let it heal over time. We talk often about the fact that we can retrain the colon so that if we effectively empty the colon regularly, it'll actually start behaving and working better. And then we can talk to the family down the road. Um, usually we give it about at least six months that then we could talk about laxatives in the future. But at this point in time, we felt that it was best for him to start daily enemas. So then if you go to the next slide, um, if we talked a lot about our enema program and when we talked about our bowel management program a few months ago, but I just wanted to bring reiterate how we start enemas. And we usually use a base of saline as our volume. And we usually start with about 20 mLs per kilo as our, um, as our, as our base. Um, and I don't usually go above 400 to start with. So we use normal saline as a base and then, and then we add glycerin, which is a, just a soap over the counter. We use liquid vegetable glycerin and this acts as an irritant to kind of irritate the bowl, bowel, make it contract and help that stool to be evacuated. We'll usually start around 10 mLs and we'll work up by five to 10 mLs per adjustment until we get to a max of 40. If we get to 40 and we're still not having success, then we can talk about adding in additional irritants. And we have there listed that we'll use Castile soap or baby shampoo or bisacodyl are all different options that we can try to add in um, depending on the patient's tolerance and and what their stooling pattern is looking like. But these are all things that we do one step at a time. And then if you go to the next slide, uh, this is just kind of reiterating how we adjust an enema once we're starting them. So usually we get x-rays on our patients, but the goals of, these, of, the, of the enema is to be able to give it once a day, clean the entire colon and not have a bowel movement for, the, for 24 hours until they give the enema again. So if we get an abdominal x-ray and it shows an accumulation of stool, uh, then we'll go up on the irritant on, or sometimes we'll consider the volume, but usually the irritant first. If the x-ray is clean and the patient is having accidents, then usually we're overstimulating them with the medication and we'll try to decrease the strength of the flush. And if the x-ray is clean and they're not having accidents, then obviously we have met our goal and we're gonna continue that same regimen. So I have a quick question and you may have the answer a little later. How long do you have to do this to finally figure out what is the right frequency and then reach a point where you say, okay, now he can go back to uh, normal. Yeah. So most of our patients come for a bowel management week, which is usually three appointments that are about every other day. Um, and by the end of that, we're usually pretty close to their perfect regimen. And sometimes it might take another extra day or two after that. Um, but they usually go home and then we can kind of tinker with their regimen remotely. But I would say within a week and a half, we usually can have a good regimen for most of our patients. Um, and then there's always tinkering as patients change their activity or their diet or they grow, you know, there's constantly reasons that we need to adjust it, but we can usually get to a pretty good base after about a week or so. Got it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So for this little guy, um, we start. We tried to start him on enemas uh, before he came to clinic because we knew about what was going on with him and we had seen him for his exam, exam under anesthesia. But the family kept going back to their cleanouts that they had been doing for him for the past uh, several years. So then we gave them a specific. Uh, enema regimen of 350 normal saline and 25 of glycerin. And we signed him up for our bowel management week where he was going to come for consecutive visits. And then if you click again, just of note, this patient also had a lot of urological issues. Um, so he did have plans for a urological reconstruction. And at that time, we had planned to give him a Malone, which is anti-grade access, like from his abdomen where he can give the enemas. Um, but we had to do rectal enemas until we got to that point. So you can click twice, I think. Yeah, and then next slide. So for his first bowel, 
management visit, we had already told him to start 350 and 25 of glycerin. Uh, he, the mother told us it was taking him about 15 minutes to get the entire solution in and he would start to have output before he had gotten the entire enema in. He was sitting for about 15 minutes and he was having stool outside of his enema multiple times every day. So looking at this x-ray, it actually doesn't look that bad. He's got a little bit of stool down there in the rectum, but overall it doesn't look terrible. So if you click it again, that first visit, we recommended that he decrease his flush volume, which actually got him closer to the 20 per kilo. He was a little bit high. So we got it a little bit more concentrated to see if that might help with the constant leaking and um, stooling that he was having. And then because we came down on the flush volume, we also decreased the irritant a little bit because we didn't want to overdo it because again, his x-ray didn't look that bad. And then we asked him to increase his sit time. Generally, these patients after an enema need to sit for 30 to 45 minutes. So the fact that he was only sitting for 15 really wasn't giving him enough time to evacuate. So we asked him to move that up to 50, to 30. So then when he came in for his second bowel management visit, and this probably would have been like three or four days later, usually we start on a Friday and they come back on Monday. So now he's on 325 and 20. Um, his instill time is still about 15 minutes. Now he's sitting for 30 minutes. Um, and stooling pattern, he's still having stool outside of his, of his enema. So looking at this x-ray, he actually started to accumulate a little bit more stool. There's a little more stool on this one than the last one. So we recognize that although we were able to concentrate it and come down on the volume, we probably do need to continue to have this flush be stronger with increased irritant. So then if you hit the, yep. So then we went, uh, we kept the volume the same, but we went back up on the glycerin to 25 and we told him to keep sitting for at least 30 minutes. And then if you hit, yep. Yeah. So then he came in for his third bowel management visit. So this is on 325 and 25 of glycerin, uh, still taking about 15 minutes to go in. And he's sitting for 30 minutes. And then mom said she believes that he's still having maybe one accident a day, but she's not always in the bathroom with him. So she wasn't completely sure, but that was her belief. So this x-ray didn't look too bad, but you can still see that there's some stool in there that we don't want. And we primarily look at the descending colon, the ascending colon, which is on my left, on your right. Yeah, it looks <laughs> like the ascending colon, we're, we don't worry too much about because we kind of consider that to be tomorrow's stool. But the descending colon, we really want that to be clean after an enema because if it's not clean, then it means that they will probably have additional bowel movements outside of the flush. So he has a little bit of stool in there. So we went up on the volume, I'm oh, sorry, up on the irritant again, back to up to 30 on the glycerin and just asked him to continue sitting for that extended 30 minutes. And then he ended up actually doing really well on the 325 and 30. Um, his accidents discontinued and then he did go on to have a Malone procedure and is now getting antigrade enemas. Very good. And um, how will be the... Uh, prognosis for his rest of his life. So I think, I think he has a chance to eventually transition to laxatives if the family is interested, but we have a fair number of families that actually end up sticking with the enemas because they really like the predictability and the reliability that enemas are able to offer. So he may switch to laxatives or try them in the future, but he does, but with that antigrade access, it gives him a lot of independence and in that he's able to do those enemas on his own. So there's also a chance that he decides to stick with the enemas long term. Makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. My turn. Okay. So I'm going to present. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to present a patient who has Hirschsprung's disease with hypermotility. <clears throat> so he currently is a five-year-old male. He self-referred at two years of age due to concerns of uncontrolled constant stooling eight to 12 times a day. 
his original transition zone, which I'm sure, just a reminder in Hirschsprung's disease, there is a portion of the colon that is aganglionic or non-functioning. So the transition zone is the area in the colon that goes from non-functioning aganglionic colon to functioning colon. Oops, I lost slides. Um, there we go. So his was in the mid-transverse colon originally. He did have five episodes of enterocolitis, but only one was through following his pull through. So in 2017, he had a Yancey Suave pull through followed by Botox injection to relax non-relaxing sphincters common to children with Hirschsprung's disease. <clears throat> a year after his pull through, he did require a redo for stricture. So that's important to note thinking of how much colon he has. If we know that his original transition zone was in the mid-transverse colon, so that he doesn't have a left colon, he probably only has half of the mid-transverse, and then he had a subsequent pull through, there's potential he probably only has his right or a portion of his right colon. So always something we keep in the back of our minds looking at the surgical history. Following his and redo, can, yeah. Just a quick interjection, my apologies. For the listeners who are uh, wondering about the terms used, Dr. Mark A. Levitt, uh, from the same department. He has done a series of five lectures that is also present here on YouTube or on Dr. Bean, wherever you're listening. And you can watch those videos and that would clarify all of these uh, terms. So back to you, Lindsay. Thanks. Yeah. So he did have a couple of Botox injections. Again, very common in children with Hirschsprung's disease as they're prone to have non-relaxing internal anal sphincters. So Botox, similar to given on the forehead, it relaxes your muscles and it can relax the sphincter to allow stool to exit. You can advance the slide. <clears throat> so when he came to us, Prior to seeing us, he was taking probiotics daily. The family had trialed an adult fleet's enema. And remember, he's about two with poor tolerance. He was stooling 10 to 12 times a day. We had recommended switching to a Pedialex enema. So when we saw him uh, a month after that recommendation, when he was on a daily Pedialex enema, he was having abdominal pain, distension, constipation, diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting. We did an x-ray. This is a small picture, I apologize, but as you can see, there's no stool burden. There's none of those speckled. So it's confirming that he's hypermodal and that the stool's moving too quickly through him. He's not stooling that frequently because there's a stool burden. <clears throat> so you can hit enter. What would you do? We typically, and I, people are welcome to answer, Dr. Bean. I don't know how you, you and so let's ask, let's see. So the uh, folks who are watching on, on YouTube, you can just put your comment here. Uh, folks who are watching on Dr. Bean, you also have a comment section as well. So any thoughts on what will you do? Well, and while we get some answers, there is a question that is interesting. Unbroken says, uh, thought enemas and the sodium was bad when constantly used. Is that true? So over-the-counter enemas, we try not to use them regularly. Um, and eventually you'll see this patient is, is not, we, we switch him from over-the-counter enemas to something that we do um, or that we create make a solution that we create. Um, but I would agree in that the normal population should not do over-the-counters regularly. And even patients with anorectal malformations and Hirschsprung's disease, we try to steer away from over-the-counter enemas and we do something a little bit more gentle with just the normal saline and then adding some irritant like glycerin soap instead of phosphate. Um, but I think as long as you're under the supervision of a medical provider, um, you should be okay. Got it. Thank you very much. Going back to back to the Lindsay's question, I have no idea what am I going to do. So I, will <laughs> I see you. Melinda. <laughs> Melinda had a great suggestion. She said test diet choices. So you can hit enter one more time. Very good. That is exactly what we would do. If Dr. Bean, if you want to just hit enter. Perfect. We would start him on a constipating diet. We would add some water soluble fiber to try and bulk him. And we would consider Imodium. And I'll talk about these in a little bit more detail. You can hit what, enter again. So this is a treatment algorithm from a well-loved and often referenced uh, resource that we have in our clinic, fecal 
incontinence and constipation in children case studies. And this walks us through the algorithm we have for treating children with hypermotility. <clears throat> you can hit enter. I'm going to focus on these first three, the constipating diet, fiber, like I talked about, and Imodium. You can hit the next slide. So this is a handout that we provide many of our families discussing the constipating diet. It's a lot of words, I apologize. Um, but to summarize, we want to avoid things that are going to increase stooling, like raw vegetables, things that increase gas, like beans or spicy food, and then sugar, carbonated drinks, things with fructose or sorbitol, any kind of sweeteners, these are all going to increase stooling as well as greasier foods. So we give parents kind of the starting parameters. Understanding additives in medications is also really important. So some of the liquid formulations of medications have sugar in them. Um, so keeping that in mind when we are figuring out a medication regimen. Um, <clears throat> diet is constantly something we're learning on, and I will freely admit I am not a nutritionist and I have limitations. So this is kind of our starting area of where we start with diet, but we certainly refer to our nutrition colleagues often. And every time we have families that meet with them, I learn something new. So as you can see in this um, slide, Plain rice milk is what we would recommend. Um, many people, pediatricians, say cow's milk is actually constipating. So rice is kind of a hot topic. Um, many of our nutritionists, we might have a child try cow's milk, and if it does increase stooling, they will recommend a high protein, like a pea protein milk. Another area on here where diet, again, is very nuanced are ripe bananas. So actually, bananas, we want to be, for constipating, purposes, we want to have a green unripe banana. That means the starches in bananas are starch. They have not converted to sugar. They're going to slow someone down versus a yellow, very ripe banana. All those starches have converted to sugar and they're going to increase stooling. So all this to say diet is extremely complex. There's many nuances to it. And so this is really a basic starting point for many of our families. All right, moving along. That's diet. You can hit Yep. So next is fiber. Fiber is another area where we're constantly learning and how to choose the right fiber. There's all different types of fiber, but tip the at a base kind of very basic level, the fiber needs to have a high water holding capacity. The colon is very dehydrating. That's the whole point. It's, it's forming the stool. So we want to find a fiber that can allow for fiber to resist the dehydrating ability of the colon and it can absorb water. So things to look for for fiber, we want it to be soluble, which means it can dissolve, the fiber can dissolve in water versus remaining intact like some of the insoluble fibers. We want it to be viscous. So viscous re refers to soluble fibers that thicken when hydrated. So, um, and then we want the fibers to form a gel. So soluble viscous fibers have polymers and I'm, going to geek out a little bit about fiber. So um, stick with me for just a second. <laughs> so the polymers, they meld in all these patterns and the tighter and more regular those patterns are going to form a gel and that's going to be present throughout the stool and that's going to cause stool to be gelled. So it's not going to be too hard and it's not going to be too watery. It's going to be a nice gel consistency. <clears throat> and then we want non-fermented fibers. So fermentation is just the rate and degree once fibers are just digested in the small bowel that the gut breaks them down. When fibers are broken down or fermented, we have byproducts, fermentation byproducts, things like short chain fatty acids, gas, which can lead to a lot of flatulence. Um, it doesn't change the viscosity. It doesn't gel the stool. So Basically, fibers that are fermented means they are broken down, so they're not present in stool throughout the colon, so it's not going to give those benefits that we really want. Psyllium fiber, which is common, commonly known at Metamucil as a psyllium uh, husk product, is really the only stool that thickens, is viscous, gel-forming, and non-fermented. So that's, that's one of our favorites to, to provide families. It's a neutralizing fiber. If you have very loose stools, it can thicken it. And if you have very hard stools, it can soften them. So it's, it's like a miracle fiber. <laughs> you can hit next slide. So Imodium um, 
or lapiramide is an antidiarrheal. Um, it is it inhibits the peristalsis and prolongs the transit time in the colon. So this increases stool viscosity like we talked about before. We typically will start our children on a very low dose. So 0 0.25 milligrams per kilogram. And we divide that into twice a day or three times a day dosing. We can increase based on weight. So we're constantly asking our families, how much does he weigh? Has he gained weight? And we do 0 0.8 milligrams per kilogram a day or a max of 16 milligrams. And we really decide dosing of Imodium based on their stooling pattern. So if all of their stools are in the evening, we're going to want to give Imodium earlier in the day to try and slow down some of those stools at that time. <clears throat> We also, for Imodium, as it comes in liquid formation, we actually avoid the liquid form because of that sugar content. And so it, it can inadvertently cause increased stools because they're, they're taking a medication with high sugar content. So we typically have our families crush the tablets um, and mix it in foods that they can take like yogurt or applesauce um, or give it that way instead of the liquid. So quick question. Mm -hmm. And Broken says, question, what's the difference between psyllium husks versus something like Metamucil or Senna? So great question. Metamucil is a type of psyllium husk. So they're the same thing. It's just a brand that a fiber that is psyllium husk. And Senna is actually a stimulant laxative. So that's going to push stool through the colon faster. Um, it will inadvertently cause stool to be looser because it's spending less time in that dehydrating setting. But different mechanisms of action. action. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Next slide. We can talk about his timeline. <clears throat> so we started him on the constipating diet. He's now taking pectin, which is a different type of fiber, three times, twice a day. And he was started on Imodium. He's still having constant stooling. His rash has returned because of this stool skin contact. So we recommended increases the Imodium to spread out the dose and give him a stronger dose to try and slow him down. Two week follow-up, you, you'll notice the difference between this child's follow-up versus Katie's previous recommendation is we give much more time to see how these um, medications work. So when you're constipated and we're giving you medications to stool, we can see a much quicker effect. When you're having increased stooling and we're trying to slow you down, it takes a lot longer to see those effects. So two weeks later, um, he is still having overnight stools. His rash has improved. The family has started giving them him a Pedialax enema at night, but it's still uh, causing overnight stools. And then we did an x-ray, which again is small, I apologize, but you can see there is some stool bulked. So hooray, we are, we are slowing him down. That's great news. Um, but he's having overnight stools and smearing. He's not at his max Imodium dose, so I don't know if any of you guys have ideas of what you would do next. So while we all think about the questions, I'm going to ask you a question that yeah. <laughs> Casey is asking. Yeah. So Casey is saying, what is a good substitute for someone intolerant to psyllium? So they've tried different psyllium products and different formulations. I would always, we always try, if you are maybe not tolerant of metamucil, trying a different type of psyllium. There's console, there's many different brands to see if the brand is, is better tolerated. There's also different forms between powders and capsules and even wafers. So there are many different Got types of, of, of fiber, but psyllium is really the only one, unfortunately, that is gel forming, viscous, non-fermented, all those, all those um, categories that we talked about. Got it. So what would you do? Question for you, <laughs> Lindsay. <laughs> so we would increase their Imodium because it sounds like he still has room for that. His stools were still a little bit looser. And then we would replace his Pedialax enema with a low volume enema. A little different than the enema Katie was just talking about because this child has less of a colon and the propensity to move stool through it faster. We don't want to overstimulate him with too big of a uh, enema. So you can hit the next slide and I'll talk about low volume enemas. So all of these supplies are available over the counter. The goal is to clear stool in the lower colon to keep him clean overnight so that he then, um, the skin has a break 
and is not constantly exposed to stool, heals, his rash is healed, he's sleeping better. Many, many benefits to having a child sleep better. So families will get an extra large fleet bottle over the counter. It's the 7.8 ounces, which is about 230 milliliters. We give the families recipes to make saline, which is just using table salt and water. Same liquid glycerin that Katie discussed that you can buy, we'd have them purchase that in lubricant. Um, as opposed to Katie's regimen, we would typically start this at a lower volume. So we typically do 10 milligrams per kilogram of saline as opposed to 20 and a lot lower volume of glycerin, five to 10 milliliters. And then we get we have parents give this before bed, again, to give the skin, um, hopefully clear the stool for a longer period of time so that they're clean overnight. <clears throat> Next slide. Next slide. All right, so we started the low volume enema. Mom sent us an email the next day that it went well, which is always half the battle. Um, and he had very little overnight stool success. So that's amazing. We followed up a month later. He's now on pectin twice a day or fiber twice a day. He's on four milligrams of Imodium spread throughout the day, which is not his max dose. And he's taking a low volume enema. <clears throat> He also had an upper respiratory infection and was on antibiotics. We know the antibiotics are going to cause him to stool more. So many of our families will reach out to us um, and we'll have them contact us once he's off antibiotics back to baseline. If the stooling is still increased at that point, we'll figure out dosing regimen. We found if we change the regimens while they're on antibiotics, we're kind of chasing our tail because the antibiotics are the cause of the increased stooling. So we, we do, again, in these hypermodal kids, really take a step back, take our time, and try not to rush into changes of the regimen, knowing it's going to take longer to see effects. So we, so we recommended increasing the Imodium for a week. Um, for a month after that, increased Imodium caused decreased streaking, which is huge. Um, he's showing interest in potty training, so the family is going to try that. We recommended... If he can have a stool in the potty before bed, he doesn't need the low volume enemas. So everyone was thrilled with that move. Then a month later, he's now on a modium two milligrams three times a day, which is his max weight for dose. He's on one serving of fiber three times a day. There are rare days with smearing, which have now progressed to multiple days of stooling. He's not having overnight stools. This is a picture of his x-ray, which also is clean. So... What would you do if we're maxed on Imodium? He doesn't need the low volume enema because the overnight stools don't seem to be a problem. And he is taking three servings of fiber, which is pretty hard to increase more at a child of this age. Any thoughts? Hmm. Let's see. <laughs> There's a, there's a look. at the top of the slide. Lepsin? Yes, we add a different <laughs> medication, Dr. Bean. Great, great thinking. Excellent. I am doing it. <laughs> so you can advance to the next slide. You might need to hit it a couple times. Hmm. So this is, we're going back to that treatment algorithm, and you can hit enter a couple times. We did the constipating diet. We did the fiber, enter, and Imodium he's maxed out on. And so we added that. Um, low volume enema, which is not on there because Levson an anticholinergic, which I'll go talk about a little bit more detail on the next slide. I'm going to remember all of these now. So when you say what would you <laughs> do next, I will know. <laughs> all right. Let's go to the next one. Yes, please. So Levson or hyacinine is an anticholinergic and antispasmatic agent. So the anticholinergics, we always want to think carefully about um, because they're going to decrease all kind of our secretions and stools. So in that, um, we can also see effects in the cardiovascular and central nervous system. So pulse and, and dehydration are all things to think about. So the medication works pretty quick in a couple minutes. It lasts for about four to six hours. So it's a quick acting, short lasting, relatively medication. We do want to think about some of those side effects, the anticholinergic side effects. So um, it can cause, especially in these young kids, the number one thing we want to think about is overheating. So in summers when kids are outside, 
running around, maybe not drinking, we do have a lot of complaints that they're they're more flushed. Um, so we're always encouraging oral hydration, making sure that we're staying on top of that. Um, we Populations that we want to consider closely about using this are those with cardiovascular disease, especially for the reasons we just talked about, hyperthyroidism and children with renal impairment. So when we're dosing children after we've cleared them and it's safe to give them this medication, we've warned families about possible side effects, we start very low. This is not a weight-based medication, so we can start at 0.625 milligrams twice a day with a max of 0.75 milligrams a day. And again, we slowly would increase that over a long period of time. Next slide. Okay, so he's now on his max dose of Imodium. He's on three servings of fiber. We've added Levsin. Two month follow up. In this time period, we've reached out to the family and we're doing constant check in. So he's two months later, now at his max dose of Levsin. He's still on the Imodium dose and he's still on his three doses of, of fiber. Despite being on a max dose of Levsin, he's still having increased stooling. You can look at his x-ray. It doesn't look overly impressive, um, but I do see a little bit of stool on the right. So what would you do? We'll go back to the chart and read the next one. That you <laughs> I know, but there. this is a trick because that chart doesn't have it. We would restart his rectal enemas. Oh, man. Stop. You knew I, I'm going to do I that. I know, I know. Okay, so you tell us. So we would restart his rectal enemas, yep. Uh, he had stopped that to try potty training, but I do see a little accumulation of stool. So again, thinking about that as a tool to give him a break from stooling. So we would we started that for this family and then a conclusion for them on the next slide. Um, the family actually ended up meeting with a local gastroenterologist, which is always another example of really the collaborative care for these children. Um, so he started a treatment for small bowel intestinal overgrowth using 10 days of oral flagell every month on top of his hypermodal treatment as we just were not able to, to stop his breakthrough stooling. He responded really well with this and had resolution of his smearing. In August, the family had reached out because they were interested in the integrate option for his low volume enemas as opposed to doing them rectally. So he got uh, Malone appendicostomy for a, a route of um, his daily enemas. He also had an exam under anesthesia where we look really carefully at his dentate line and his sphincters and kind of figure out his potential for continence. His exam under anesthesia revealed patulous anus with minimal evidence of a dentate line, which is concerning that he may have an inability to be continent of stool. So for him, his kind of long-term plan, um, he's currently clean on the Malone flushes. He's still on his hypermodal agents, and we're going to try and wean off of those agents. But we're also going to try and have him hold his flush to see if he's able to hold and be continent of a large volume like that. It can take a long time to get children to hold the flush. I don't even know if I could do that without an underlying condition holding that much volume. And we have them hold it for a goal of 10 minutes. If he's unable to hold that for 10 minutes, um, in the future, Dr. Levitt and the surgeons we work with have a procedure called sphincter reconstruction, where they actually tighten the muscles of his sphincter to hopefully give him better control. So we're kind of in the process right now. He's clean on his Malone flushes and all of his hypermodal medications. We're trying to wean off the medications. If we're having a hard time, he can't wean off of them. He can't hold his flush after practicing for a long period of time. We would then consider sphincter reconstruction to get him cognitive stool. So that's kind of his long-term prognosis. Okay. So then our last case study is a patient with functional constipation. This was a six-year-old little girl. Uh, she weighed about 20 kilos. Again, this is not a picture of the patient, but she is an adorable little girl who looks about six years of age. Um, so she, oh, you can go to the next slide. So she got referred to our um, program from our gastroenterology colleagues. Uh, she had been taken to the OR by them to evaluate her motility. So they were able to rule out um, Hirschsprung's disease, which is what they were concerned for because of her longstanding history of constipation. 
They also looked at her anorectal manometry, uh, which is a study of her like pelvic floor and pelvic muscles. And they found that she has pelvic floor dysinertia, which means that sometimes like either when you're squeezing, you're not relaxing, um, like your, your muscles in, on your pelvic floor are not necessarily doing what you intend for them to do. And so then that makes it difficult to go to the bathroom. They also did colonic manometry to kind of see her motility throughout her colon. Um, and so it sh showed that she did have motility throughout her colon, which responded to medication. Um, so, um, so then she was referred to our program and she got a laparoscopic Malone, which is an anti-grade enema. Again, this was probably because of her age, because she had never had good bowel movements and we were going to have to do enemas and the family opted to go ahead and go the anti-grade route. And so she got a laparoscopic Malone and had been doing fairly well with, it, with that. And then if you go to the next page, she also had imaging done. So she had this contrast study done, and this was prior to her Malone, so before she started doing the regular enemas. And you can see that she has some dilation, but not as bad as our, our previous patient with anorectal malformation. But she does have some dilation there that um, was hopefully decreased by the administration of the daily enemas. And then you can go to the next slide. So her timeline when she came to us this time around, um, she had been doing a daily enema of 400 normal saline and then 35 mLs of glycerin. She wasn't having any issues or complaints with her enema. She wasn't having any accidents. She was able to hold her flesh for 10 minutes, which Lindsay was just talking about that a lot of times we kind of tell these families this Malone is a, a bridge to continence and it's something that they should practice. And she was doing it beautifully. Uh, she had also started pelvic floor physical therapy for her pelvic floor dysinergia, and that had been going well. We knew that prior to her Malone, she was getting eight chocolate squares of Exlax a day in order to in order to have a bowel movement, which is 30, 60, 90 milligrams of set of Senna or Exlax. Uh, so a lot. Um, and at the time that she came, she was on a gluten-free diet, but otherwise had a good appetite, was a good eater. Uh, the mother did note that she saw a major shift in the patient with the upcoming school year and said that the her daughter was had developed a self-motivation and curiosity about transitioning back to laxatives and away from the daily enemas. And she thinks that her daughter understands that if it doesn't work, then our plan would be to go back to the flush. But at this point in time, she felt that she could handle it and, and she was ready to give it a try. So we are gonna start enemas, or sorry, so we're gonna start laxatives for this little girl. So we typically use Senna, uh, which is based on uh, Senna sides, um, which is a natural plant laxative. And we usually start around two megs per kilo when we're starting a dose on one of these patients who have been chronically constipated. There's not really a, a max dose for Senna. It's more based on tolerance. So if you get to the point that the medicine's still not working, but the patient is uncomfortable and having cramping, then we know that we need to find other options for them. Um, but there's not really like a, a max dose that we can go to. Uh, so we do say some just titrating effects. Senna is going to cause loose stools because we're pushing the stool through the colon faster than it would normally travel. So as a side effect, the, your body doesn't have an, as much time to absorb the water from the colon. So then the stools do become more loose. And to combat that, we'll usually add fiber to somebody who's on a hefty dose of Senna. I'm sorry, holding the flush so means holding the enema. So, Got it. Uh, Thank you. Sorry, we go back and forth, and we sorry for sometimes forget that that's not normal language. Uh, an, an enema to us, we use the same terminology to flush. It's just typically we say flush when we mean that it's coming from above, or they're doing it in a, as an integrate option through their stomach. Got so it. So if they're having loose stools, we usually add fiber, water soluble fiber, which Lindsay did a wonderful job of just telling you all about. Um, likewise, if they're not having stools and they're on Senna, then we know that the dose isn't strong enough. And usually we'll have them give either an enema if they've been on enemas before. So if they have a regimen of normal saline and glycerin that they've used previously, then we'll just tell them to go ahead and use that. If they haven't been on enemas before, then we'll use an over-the-counter enema one time to try to play catch up. Um, and then we'll go up on their laxative dose. 
I tell all of our families that laxatives are really good at preventing constipation because they help have regular bowel movement. But if you're already constipated, it's not a good idea to give a large dose of Senna because it will usually just cause patients to have stomach upset because there's not enough room in the colon for it to get the medicine out uh, distally. So then it'll you'll start to feel sick and, and usually patients throw up or have emesis. So if you go to the next slide. So at her first bowel movement visit, she had a pretty good x-ray, but remember she's been doing daily enemas th through her Malone uh, with 400 mLs of normal saline and 35 of glycerin. Again, she's not having any accidents and she can hold her, her enema or her flush for up to 10 minutes. So she's doing really well. So we had to figure out a starting dose for her. And typically we would do two megs per kg, but because we knew she was on such a high dose of Senna before, we went ahead and started her on, I believe if you hit one more time, it should show up. I believe it was four squares, which is like 60 milligrams of X-lax. I said that right, right, Lindsay? I'm like I'm doing that math right. <laughs> okay, so like 60 milligrams of X-lax. Um, I usually don't go above 60 as a starting dose. Um, so we'll do somewhere between two megs per keg or 60 as a as a max to start with and, and then see how the patient tolerates it just because you don't want to go above board, especially somebody who hasn't been on laxatives um, or um, a fairly young patient because you don't want to steer them away from the medication that ultimately might really help them. Um, so I usually stop at 60. So she, we started at four squares. I do tell families and patients that you're going to feel some cramping when you start laxatives like Senna, and it should be normal cramping that lets your body know that you need to go to the bathroom. Similar to anybody who's not on laxatives and has regular bowel movements, you feel some cramping and then you know you need to go to the bathroom. So that is normal. What I tell patients though, what is not normal is to have those cramping to go to the bathroom and then to have that cramping persist. And if that happens, then we know that we're too high. So she got started on four squares. We asked the families to give the medication at the same time every day. We usually encourage sit time after meals when you're first starting laxatives because every time you eat, it triggers peristalsis or that movement for your, through your intestine. So you, you're vulnerable to have a bowel movement at those times. And in the beginning, when you're starting laxatives, we don't know exactly how your body's going to respond or when your body's going to respond. So to try to limit any accidents, particularly for these kids, um, we just tell them to go to the bathroom every time after they eat and see if anything comes out. We try to decrease the snacking and we're working with a pediatric population so eliminating snacking is nearly impossible but we do <laughs> want to try to minimize it just so that they're not triggering peristalsis all day long uh, she was going to continue her pelvic floor therapy and then she has a device in her malone site that keeps it open and we asked her to keep that in place for now because we want to make sure that she successfully transitioned to laxatives before we get rid of that integrate option so then she comes in for her second visit. Now she's taking four squares of x -lax. She's doing it the same time every day. For three days following her first visit, she did have a medium-sized bowel movement about 12 hours after x -lax, which is typically what we start to see when somebody starts laxatives regularly. They start to have a pattern. Um, but then she had a bowel movement on the day of the follow-up visit that was medium in size and mashed potato consistency she wasn't having any accidents, um, no pain, nausea, vomiting, like side effects were not happening. Uh, she hadn't done any flushes or enemas since we last saw her and she was continuing her pelvic floor therapy. So laxatives are a little bit different than enemas in that the colon doesn't have to be completely clean, but ideally if you're within those 12 hours of giving, of having the bowel movement, we still like that descending colon to be fairly clean. You can see she does have a, a good amount of stool or cloudiness in that descending colon. Um, so then if you click it again, um, we did go up on her x -lax dose, continued to ask her to give it at the same time and have the sitting time after meals Yep, everything else was the same, the same. So we just went up a little bit on her dose. And then when she came in for her third visit, she was on four and a half squares. You can see this x-ray looks cleaner. There's less evidence of stool in that descending colon. 
Um, generally, mom reports that she has a bowel movement around 7 p.m., but they're small. She's not having any accidents. Um, and she did have her a complaint that she didn't feel empty after doing the, the um, sorry, after having the bowel movement, but that, then nothing else came out. And she continues to go to her pelvic floor therapy. So with that, because she reported that symptom of not feeling empty, uh, and she does have some stool in her rectum there, we just on the safe side, like asked her to go up to five squares and see what happens. We are, especially when we have this time with patients, we tend to be a little bit more aggressive and then we can always back down. But since we have the time with the patient, we wanna make sure that we're optimizing their, their regimen. So we asked her to go up to five and everything else stayed the same. And she continued to have her, her sit time and her meals and pelvic floor th therapy. And then if you go to the next slide, she actually ended up going back down to four and a half on her own because she felt the, the cramping at the five squares. And on the four and a half, she started, she was doing really well and had no accidents. Eventually that feeling of not feeling empty went away and she was having regular bowel movements. And then if you go to the next slide, this is just a picture of our colorectal team at Children's National. Um, and then I guess if there's any other questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Awesome, thank you so much to both of you, Catherine and Lindsay, for this presentation. Awesome presentation, and I'm sure that the listeners, especially on the Dr. Bean side, my medical students, nursing students, and, and uh, physicians, they would really enjoy it as well. Um, let's see if there are any questions here. In the meantime, uh, how is Dr. Mark A. Levitt? <laughs> how is Dr. Levitt doing? <laughs> He's doing well. Excellent, excellent. So. Um, Let's see if there is any. OK, so it looks like we are good. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. I think we should do these kind of case studies maybe once every quarter to present a couple of cases, if you are OK with that. You're so welcome. I think that would be fun. Awesome. So with this, thank you very much, Catherine and Lindsay. And I would see you the next time. Right. Cool beans, thank, thank you very you. much for listening in as well. Thanks for having us. Bye. -bye. Bye. Yes.